I'm just going to let it die. I'm just going to let it die. Just, we don't need that. We don't need that. Hey, I'm Harrison. Uh, super excited to be here. Um, everybody do me a favor. Let's just take a deep breath real quick. <coughs> Got some wheezers out there. Um, let's do it one more time. Here we go. Hold on. You know, we were just singing this song, and uh, and it just kind of got me thinking about what we're about to talk about. You sang, if you were singing, who am I, and then you sang all these things. Who am I that you call me that you love me? Who am I that you call me yours? Some of us right now, I think we're just owning those songs. You know what I'm talking about? We're, we're renting these songs. We're, we're coming we're here, we're pumped up, we're, we're excited about this. But when we sing these songs, we're all excited about it. But sometimes we're, we're renting these things. Like, do you really think, do you really believe that God calls you his? Like, when he sees you, he sees you as his daughter. And he's going like, man, you are mine. I'm going to do anything in my power to make sure you discover exactly who you were created to be. And I'm going to do everything in my power as long as you will come to me. I'm going to do everything in my power for you to discover exactly who you are and exactly what you were created for. Do you actually believe that? This is an opportunity. This week's an opportunity. Guys, I'm just telling you, you can put a lot of stuff to the side. By the end of this, when we sing that song, I want us to own it. You know what I'm talking about? Like when you walk away from this week, you go, that song's mine. Who am I? The creator God in the, of the universe would call me his. And this is special. This is something awesome. This is something awesome that we get to be a part of. And this whole week is, how do you discover rest of your life? Rest for your soul. It's going to last for the rest of your life. Um, let me tell you a quick story, and we're going to jump into this. Uh, I got four kids. Don't know how they keep coming, but they keep doing, keep coming. That's cool. Um, and uh, I remember when Callie Jo, my third, just kidding, I know, I know how babies are made. Um, third, ca third child, Callie Jo, she was being born, okay? So we were living in Statesboro, represent. Statesboro, come on. <clears throat> we're, well, technically, Brooklyn, Brooklyn. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, you are like, is that a real place? It is. Okay, so we were, we, so we were heading into the Savannah um, to have Callie Jo, and uh, this is our third child, so we just kind of knew what's going on. Um, the doctor didn't even make it, and so I looked at the nurse, and I was like, hey, do you know what you're doing? Because I've had two kids, and I can do this if I have to. And she was super offended, um, but, you know, my bad. Um, but anyway, so, so we go to the hospital. Um, my wife does most of the work. Um, she has a baby. We're there for a couple of days. Uh, we're exhausted, though, um, because you're, you're staying up a lot, and you're just trying to chart things, and you're trying to make sure everything's okay. And so the day we're getting ready to go, uh, we get a call from our friends who are watching our other kids, Harrison and Emma Grace. And they said, hey, don't freak out, which is a cue to like, oh, this is about to get good, you know. Don't freak out. Harrison uh, busted his forehead wide open right in the middle. I don't think it's that bad. But we're taking them to the hospital. And so we were in Savannah at a hospital for three days, got a call, and went straight to a hospital in Statesboro where I get to go look at my son. And heads up, it was bad. You could, like, see the bone in his head. And I was like, oh, my goodness. So, so it was one of those things that, like, we were exhausted, and then it came again. Like, we were like, man, I cannot wait to just get home and get in my bed and just rest. And then something else came. Have you ever felt that? Like you've been in these seasons where it's like you're in school and it's getting hard and then you got sports and the season's getting a little more complicated or you're in this club and, and the, the, you got exams coming and then you got these finals coming and then all of a sudden you got some weird relational stuff going on in your friend group and so now there are two groups. You're trying to figure out which group am I supposed to be a part of and then maybe you get sick or your family, someone in your family gets sick and so it just feels like, man, all this stuff keeps Adding up, it keeps getting worse. And just like in that video, the guy was talking about, he said, hey, look, Jesus says there's a different way to do life. There's a different way to do this. But your experience, your lived experience, think about your week, what your lived experience, 
It was exhausting. But Jesus says, there's another way, right? My yoke is easy, my burden is light. I won't read the whole thing. But Jesus just simply says, come. Come to me. That's what this week is about. I wish I knew every one of you. I wish I could sit down with you and drink coffee or whatever you like to drink. And and we could just go like, hey, listen, listen. Come to him. Come to him. This solves a lot of your problems. You're trying to do life in a way that's exhausting. And you're just getting started at it. It gets worse unless you figure this thing out. Come to him. Jesus is saying, I have something that your soul is desperate for, but you have to come. You got to show up. So that's what we're going to be talking about is the posture. It's the posture that we would humble ourselves, come to him, and that we would receive what he has. And what he brings to your soul is rest. All right, so we're going to look at a cool story about that. If you got a Bible, go ahead and turn to Luke 10. Go ahead and turn there. I know we all got them. Luke 10. Let's do it. If you don't have it, fake it. Act like you're turning there right now. I'm looking it up on my phone. Okay. Luke 10, that's where we're going to be jumping into it. But here's what I want you to do. I I think somebody told you, hey, bring a Bible. If you don't have a Bible, we'll try to help you figure that out. I want you to take notes. How many of you are journalers? Anybody journal? Okay. Okay. There are like 20 of us that still know how to write with a pen. That's awesome. That's what I'm talking about. Okay. All right. Well, let's take notes. Let's dig into this. There, you, get, you get a choice right now. You can just sit there and kind of zone out, or you have a chance to encounter everything Jesus has for you through his word. You make the decision right now. What are you going to do about it? Are you going to lean into this, or are you just going to zone out? Come on. Let's jump in. Luke 10. A little bit of context. Luke 10 tells this famous story of the Good Samaritan. Anybody know that story? The story about the, the Samaritan who helps this guy who's been injured, and he's passed by all these other religious guys. So these two stories go back to back, the Good Samaritan and then Jesus kind of going to Mary and Martha's house. These stories go together. The first story, the context is simply like focus on these uh, vertical or these horizontal relationships that you have. How do you love one another well? How do you serve one another well? That's what the Good Samaritan is going to tell you about. But if you don't realize how to focus on your horiz- or your vertical relationship, how to love God well, you're not going to love each other well. That's what this story is about. Mary and Martha, they're going to show us how do we love God well? How do we run after him? Look at verse 38. If you don't have a Bible, we are going to put it up, I believe. If it's not up there, then you're just going to have to trust me. Verse 38, Luke 10. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. I think these two verses are awesome because these two verses give us a picture of what we should do. Martha opened her home and said, Jesus, come in. And Mary sat there, gave him her full attention and said, any word that you want to say, I'm going to eat it up. I want all you've got for me. What if that was your life? You live that life. Be like Martha, open the home, say, Jesus, you always got a place here. But be like Mary, sit at his feet, listen deeply, everything he has is good. But then there's a problem. Look at verse 40. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. And honestly, I think Martha gets a bad rap sometimes. You know what I mean? Because, I, you know, in the South, we hospitality is a big deal. She was serving, right? She was doing good stuff. And, and she kind of gets a, a negative look in this story. But in the South, it's like, man, come on. Someone's coming over. You got to put something in the oven. You got to bake brownies and vanilla ice cream. That's what everybody's supposed to do. If you didn't know that, if your friend comes over, you should put brownies in the oven and pull out vanilla ice cream. That's how you are hospitable. And that's exactly what I think Martha was probably doing. But it seems like something else is going on, right? It's more than just she's busy trying to get things ready for dinner. There's something that she's just missing, like something big is happening in her house, and somehow she's just missing this amazing opportunity. And so the rest of verse 40 says this, she came to Jesus and said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. This sounds just like my kids. Anybody got siblings? Does that sound like you right there? Mom, tell him that he needs to... Right? I can hear all of you guys saying that right there. But that's what it sounds like. It sounds like two siblings just kind of coming at each other. But here's what's kind of amazing about this. 
Um, I can tell. It's going to get real sweaty up here. Um, This is what's amazing about this. Martha comes to Jesus and tells him what to do. Mary comes to Jesus and listens to everything he has to say. We approach Jesus in many different ways. At this point, be like, be like Mary. Sometimes we come to Jesus and we're like, hey, Jesus, you need to do this. You need to solve this problem. You need to fix this thing. You need to make me happy. You need to. And Mary just kind of showed up and she had this posture of just sitting before Jesus saying like, whatever you want to say, I'm hanging on every word. All that you have, I want it. That's what, that's what I think we want to be. We want to be like Mary. We want to listen. We want to have the same posture that she had. Verse 41. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. You know she's in trouble because she she said it twice. Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better. She's chosen what's better, and it's not going to be taken from her. Look at this. The things that she's worried about became the things she became upset about. She had all these distractions in her life. She started to get worried about all these little things. And then that worry turned into she became upset and frustrated at her sister. And these things just kind of took over. She was restless. She was restless. That's what was going on in her soul. And Jesus looked at her and said, Mary's chosen the better thing. The actual word is Mary's chosen the better portion, the good portion. In our house, we have a rule. If there's like one biscuit left and two kids want it, Y'all have a rule like this in your house? Okay. They, they, whoever cuts it, the other person gets to decide which half they get. Is that the rule in your house? It's a good rule. If you don't have that rule, you need to use it. But, but here's what I think is happening. This is what the text is actually saying. The, the, the meal has been divided, and Mary has, cho- Mary has chosen the best portion. She chose the best piece of the meal. In fact, look at how the message um, talks about this. The message writes it this way. The master said, Martha, dear Martha, you are fussing far too much, getting yourself worked up over nothing. Does that sound like anybody in here? Does that sound like you? You just get worked up about stuff that just doesn't matter? All right, well then listen. Listen to this next part. One thing only is essential, and Mary has chosen it. It's the main course. It's the best part of the meal. And it's not going to be taken from her. What Jesus is saying in this, he's going, Martha, you're trying to get this meal ready. And Mary has chosen the best part of the meal. And it's right here. He's right in her living room. He's sharing the words of God saying, like, this is what leads to life. And you're missing it. Let me introduce you to some folks. Um, This is a picture of Miss Jenny and Sub. Y'all know Miss Jenny? Come on. Oh, man. A lot of you guys know Sub. A lot of you guys know Sub. But Miss Jenny, Miss Jenny is one of my heroes, okay? Let me just kind of tell you a quick story about her. And I know i got a clock that I have to pay attention to. Um, We'll do these worship nights at Henderson every now and then. Miss Jenny is one of my favorite people, and here's why. At the end of the worship night, Terrence is like, all right, all you kids, kind of come up. Let's just worship. Let's get a little crazy. Miss Jenny comes in the middle of the kids, and she's jumping around, and she's throwing candy. And I'm like, where did she get all this candy? And she's, I'm like, I don't even think this is allowed in church. But she's just like, candy for everybody. She's throwing kids up on stage. I'm like, okay, this is about to get crazy. But anyways, Miss Jenny, let me tell you why she's awesome. And I'll invite her over to our house every now and then just for this reason. Because whenever Miss Jenny shows up, she always brings the best stuff. I'm just telling you. I'll say like, hey, Miss Jenny, we're having this for dinner. You want to come? And when she comes... She will bring an entire other dinner, and it's way better than the one that we provided. I, it's just, I don't know, it's, it's her superpower is what it feels like. Just whenever she shows up, things get better. Whenever she shows up, she just brings something better to the table. And I think that's what's happening in this story. Jesus showed up, and when Jesus shows up, he brings the best stuff. He brings the main course. He brings something better than you could possibly serve or bring to the table. And so if if you just simply come to him, you get what's best, just like Mary. She chose the better portion. The best part of the meal, heads up, is being with Jesus. 
and, and Martha missed it. Listen, heads up. There is a version of coming to camp and being here and hearing all these songs and getting all fired up and still missing Jesus. There's, it's possible that he could be calling you, drawing you to himself, having something big for your life, and you're just, you miss it. You're distracted. See, this version of trying to live for Jesus, some of us, we've already made this decision to follow Jesus, but we see it like I have to work for him, right? Just like he was saying in the video, I have to do all these things for Jesus, and he's just going like, hold on, time out. This is a with me invitation. I want you with me. I want you to be a part of what I am doing in this world. Martha, she was doing for Jesus. Mary was focused on being with him. In fact, you know, some of us, we're still trying to figure out if Jesus really is all he claims to be, you know? Like if you're new to church and you're still trying to figure out who is Jesus and what does a relationship with him look like, you're like, look, I don't know if I believe this yet. I don't know if I'm all in on this yet. And listen, I am so pumped you're at camp. I wish I could live at camp because I love camp so much. But I just want to challenge you on something, okay? Listen to me. Ask your heart a question. That thing that's kept you from choosing to follow Jesus, that thing that's in the way of you actually getting to know him and trust him, and choose to pursue him for rest and forgiveness in your soul rather than running after all these other things. Man, ask your question. Dude, listen, I'm going to be here all week. I love talking about how good Jesus is. But what's better is talk to your small group leader. Ask the questions, whatever it's been that's in your way. Man, this is the moment for you to do this. But just like in the story we read, there are distractions that get in the way of seeking, get, get in the way of us seeing Jesus for who he really is. And then delighting in being with them. There are things, these distractions. There are two kinds of distractions. Here's the first one. Worry. You get worried about stuff. When you get worried, your attention goes other places. You know, the most expensive thing these days is our attention. What you give your attention to. There are billion dollar companies asking the question, how do we steal more of your attention? And that's what worry does. It steals our attention. You know, freshmen, sophomores, listen, you're, you're in this place where you're trying to like go, man, where do, I, where do I fit in now? Right? Some of us are going like, hey, do I have to still be the same kid I was in middle school and carry those labels with me into high school? Or do, do I get a start over? Do I get a reset? And I get to be my own person now. So you're trying to figure out where do I fit or what community do I want to do life with? Man, I have a, a niece for a year that I am almost confident we didn't even make eye contact every time I saw her. And then this last time we were together, I was talking with her and I was like, and she was like, Uncle Harrison, how are you doing? How's it go what's going on in life? And blah, blah, blah. And I was always like, what is happening right now? Like you were a totally different person. What happened? And she just said, you know what? Um, I, was, I was hanging with the wrong people last year. I was searching for something, and I, I connected to a group of people that made me who I was not. Because who you spend time with, that's who you become. And that's what she did. So she distanced herself. She didn't talk with her. She started acting a different way. And this, But I'm telling you, night and day, meeting, seeing her this time, I was like, she changed her community to those who had the same things in mind as her, following Jesus, seeking after him. And juniors, you guys got to start asking some bigger questions. You actually have to be responsible for stuff. <laughs> you have to, you know, start proving yourself. You got to start going like, okay, what, what is the reason I'm here? Does God, in fact, have a purpose for my life? Did he design me for something? You got to start wrestling with these seniors, grads, you're in the same boat. You got big changes coming. Listen, there are a lot of things in our world that you could worry about. In fact, you could spend 24-7 worrying about. I mean, you think about this. How many of you have friends or yourself have dealt with anxiety on a regular basis, and it feels like there's this white noise in your head, and you never know how to quite turn that thing off, how to ever settle, how to ever find some rest. It seems like this ongoing anxious worry in your life. You feel that? 
I know there are a bunch of us in here that have felt that. Here's what the word says. There's one thing. Heads up, listen. There's one thing that if you focus on this, it tends to take care of your worry. A little bit later in Luke chapter 12, here's what Jesus actually teaches about worry. He said to his disciples, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. That's easy to say, right? Like if you're worrying about stuff and I just said, hey, don't worry about it. Does that help? Does that help you at all? No? <laughs> it doesn't help when you say that. But Jesus goes like, no, 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 let's walk through this. Let's walk through this. Don't worry about your life, what you're going to eat. Don't worry about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food and your body is more than clothes. That first one stings a little bit. Your life is more than food. I love food. I feel like life is all about food. And Jesus is saying like, no, it's not. You got there are bigger things in life. Some of us in this room, we worry a lot about our clothes. Heads up, I got my Father's Day kicks on. They're white shoes. These things stress me out. I didn't realize how scary white shoes were because you're like, am I just going to step in something and I ruin them? But, but, but for some of us, we worry about our clothes, meaning you're worrying about your image. You're consumed with how you appear to other people. You're consumed with, with kind of putting on this image for others to see, to buy into, or I don't, I don't really know. But Jesus is just going like, hey, heads up. Life is more than food. More than your clothes. Consider the ravens. They don't sow. They don't reap. They don't have storerooms or barns, and yet God feeds them. Please listen to this part. How much more valuable are you than birds? Some of you might struggle with that one. You don't see your worth. You feel worthless. You don't see yourself the way God sees you, and he values you. Look at verse 25. Who of you by worrying can even add a single hour to your life? Worrying doesn't solve anything. You know what it does? Create more problems. It says it doesn't add anything. Since you cannot do the very thing, why do you worry about rest? Look at the last verse, 31. But seek his kingdom. This is one thing. Seek his kingdom. His will, his way. Seek his kingdom. First, foremost, above all else. And then all these things, they'll be given to you as well. If you come to Jesus, you seek his kingdom. You seek his will for your life. You seek out his ways in our world. Listen, your worries will work themselves out. I promise you. Seek his kingdom first. But here's the second distraction. is temptation. The first thing that distracts us is worry. The second thing that we have to watch out for is temptation. Just to, to be clear, I don't think you should feel bad about being tempted. Jesus was tempted. Did you all know that? He was tempted. He didn't. He, in short, temptation, it's a, it's a test, but it's a test that comes with pressure. You know what I'm talking about? It's a test that kind of like squeezes you to see what's on the inside of you. And so temptation is going to come. Temptation is not sin, but it gives you an opportunity to sin. It is not sin in itself, but it's going to give you a chance. You know, in Matthew chapter 4, this is where Jesus was tempted. When Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness... To be tempted by the devil. After fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Think about that. He didn't eat for 40 days, and the scripture says, heads up, he was hungry. We know that. That's obvious. The tempter came to him at his weakest point when he was hungry. He said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. You're more than food. There's more to life than food. He says, but you will live by every word that comes from the mouth of God. What was Mary doing? She was sitting at his posture. She came to Jesus, and she was just hanging on every word. Every word he said was like food for her soul. Something in her started to settle. See, these distractions, they come. They come in worry. Come in temptation. You know how temptation is. Let me just give you a picture of this. Temptation, it, it likes to come to your house and knock on the door. And you have a chance to sit at the door and keep that door closed. You know what I'm talking about? 
But sometimes when temptation comes, we crack the door and we go, oh, man, what's up? And then we go, oh, man, I don't really want, I don't want any part of this. I don't want anything in here. So we try to shut the door and then the devil puts his foot in the door and says, man, come on, hold on. Hold on a second. Give me a chance. I can be really fun. I can be a party. But temptation stands at your door and he knocks and and you open the door. If you don't shut that door, it gets harder from there. There might be a fight to get it out, but at least you've closed the door. But to some of us, temptation comes. It's like an old friend and we're like, man, come on inside. Let's watch a movie, let's pop some popcorn. Let's get into some stuff, let's have some fun. See, the reality is temptation's way easier to fight on the front porch than it is when you let it in, let it take up residence. That's a different kind of fight. Some of us, we've let temptation come in so much that it's produced sin in our life. Every regret we have is because we open that door to temptation and we just let it take up residence. And that's the very thing, that's the very thing that now stands between you and hearing what Jesus has for you. This week you can do something about these things. These worries, these distractions, these things that get in the way of you seeing who Jesus is. Listen, worries, there are two kinds of distractions here that, that, that we need to fight. We need to be aware of these worries. They steal our attention. That belongs to Jesus. That's where rest is found. That's where hope is found. If you want to discover your identity, it's going to be found in his word, sitting at his feet saying, Jesus, more of you in my life, less of me, less of this worry, less of these temptations. Worries are trying to steal your attention. Temptation is trying to steal your affection. That belongs to Jesus. He's the only one worthy of it. He's the only one who can handle your worship. He's the only one who can handle all of your desires needing to be satisfied in something. Nothing in this life can handle it. Only Jesus can. So the posture of our heart, the invitation we're asking for, the invitation to rest, if you want to find true rest, it comes by sitting at his feet and receiving it from him first. That's what it means. We must give him our attention and our affection. Last passage I'll throw up here, 1 Peter 5, 7. Cast all your anxiety on him. Just right now where you're sitting, if you come in here with anxiety, if you come in here worrying about stuff, if you come in here bruised and beat up from fighting temptations, giving in to sin, feeling guilty, feeling shame, feeling weighed down by all those things, you come in here like that, here's what Jesus says, cast all these things on him, because he cares for you, he genuinely cares for you, he loves you, he sees you, serious, sons, daughters, he'll do anything, he'll do anything to help you see that, and he already has. Jesus went to the cross. He went to the cross. He wants us to come to him because he wants what's best. He wants what's best for you. You can trust him. So let's seek him first. That's our posture. That's how we're going to roll with it, okay? Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your love.